Hi everybody. Welcome back to the technical stage of API Days Live Singapore 2021. This is the day one, day one programs in the technical track. In continuation with the sessions in the connecting the stack, we have next set of four sessions lined up. Joining us first will be Mark Tihan, Principal Solution Engineer at Confluent APAC. He'll be talking to us about REST, the events, REST APIs for event-driven architecture. Thank you very much, Prasad. Yeah, uh, hello. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Hello, everyone. Uh, hope you all had a nice lunch, and it's a, a pleasure to be here to speak with you today. Uh, I'm Mark Tihan. I work for Confluent here in Singapore. I'm a principal engineer. Uh, and today's talk is entitled REST, the events, REST APIs for event-driven architecture. Um, I guess... Uh, unsurprisingly, for an API day's talk, there's lots of Kafka today, um, and that's really what I do. I, I, I sort of work with uh, organizations across the region, really, on anything to do with Apache Kafka. Uh, lots of banks and digital natives and insurance companies and lots of other industries that are really using Apache Kafka. So um, today's talk is really having a look at uh, the different REST API options that are available for Apache Kafka and my recommendations on when to use them and when not to use them. Um, there is, uh, if, if you saw the earlier talk from Ido from Rapid API, I highly recommend it. Uh, he really went quite deep on synchronous versus asynchronous. Um, so I'm going to be getting uh, get a, a little more into the sort of implementation details of where the various APIs that you can call um, if you are going to do REST-based calls to a Kafka system. Um, before we get into things, I guess a quick recap on what is Kafka. Um, for uh, you know, uh, not not you know, not everybody uses Kafka every day. Uh, it's a very popular open source project, and uh, uh, just a quick recap. You know, a Kafka system consists of brokers, and they are clustered together. So a minimum system is generally three brokers, uh, but you know there are systems in Southeast Asia of thirty plus brokers, and uh, uh, if we look at some of the systems uh, a bit further afield, eighty to one hundred brokers is uh, is not unheard of. Um, writers send data to a Kafka cluster. Readers read data from a Kafka cluster. Writers are often called producers. Readers are often called consumers. And it's a modern distributed platform for data streams. And I think the, the part that makes it complicated is really the, the distributed part. Um, you know, it's a cluster of brokers. And, and obviously, the, the writers and readers are generally um, small footprint services, generally some form of microservices is pretty common. Um, if you want a bit more information about Kafka and kind of its origins and where it fits into the whole data landscape, uh, how, it, how it compares you know, to database-based systems and big data-based systems, have a look at uh, Tim Berglund, my colleague, uh, his video on this on YouTube. So I, I have various QR codes scattered throughout this talk, so have your kind of camera ready if you want to. Um, use those. So as I said, I work with a lot of companies that are using Apache Kafka across the region. I mostly work in Singapore and Thailand these days. Um, and you know, we as a company, Confluent is a company behind Apache Kafka. So the, the creators of Apache Kafka are the founders of Confluent. Uh, we're based here at SunTech in Singapore. Come see us if you're Singapore based. Um, so the, the type of apps that I generally work on are often event-driven applications, uh, you know, which is a, a major subject in API days. Uh, looking at various data in motion, so real-time streaming of data around the organization. I do a lot of mainframe offload, uh, mostly from core banking systems, um, and also shipping logs and metrics and traces, which is quite a traditional Kafka pattern. Um, so let's let's take a quick look at the different ways that you can sort of build uh, an application that's going to talk to Apache Kafka. So most uh, most client applications are written in Java. So Kafka is a Java-based application. It has clients for various uh, frameworks, including Java, which is the most popular one. And though you, you write an application, include the Kafka client library, that then enables you to talk to a Kafka cluster, and you can start producing uh, or writing data into a topic. And a topic is something like a database table. Um, similarly, on the, on the data reader side, the application will include the Kafka library in order to consume messages. What if you don't want to use the Java framework? Um, so it's, it is, of course, possible to communicate via HTTP. One of the ways of doing this is using the REST proxy. 
Um, so setting up request response calls that will produce and consume to the Kafka brokers in the same way that you would produce and consume using the Kafka client if you wrote a .NET application. The other, sorry, a Java application. The other client frameworks that are available and supported are .NET and Python. And there's a whole bunch of sort of unsupported and uh, clients of various degrees of completeness available on GitHub. So that's two ways of talking to Kafka. A third way, very common, is to do change data capture using the Kafka Connect API. Kafka con consists of three APIs, so the core brokers that most are familiar with. Uh, Kafka Connect came next, which is a framework for doing data in motion and really streaming in and out of data stores. Um, and the third is Kafka Streams, which we're not really talking about today. And of course, it's possible to, 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 sh to send data from a Kafka topic through Kafka Connect and let it do inserts back out to a database again. And then the third major category of systems and, and the way you want to interact with a system are you know, for uh, large applications that don't either have an accessible database layer and you know, are not easily uh, interacted with via one of the popular frameworks such as Java or .NET. Sometimes these are called legacy applications, slightly offensive term, I guess. But these are generally sort of large vendor applications such as SAP or Oracle NetSuite and all of these sorts of apps. It is possible to use Kafka Connect with a HTTP sync in order to send data to these systems if they run their own REST endpoints, like, like SAP PI or PO. Um, and those systems are also able to interact using the REST proxy. So for today's talk, um, we're going to be looking at a few different areas here. We're going to focus, first of all, on kind of request response as a, as a, a communication paradigm for Kafka and how this compares with event streaming, um, which is uh, point two here. Uh, number three, we'll, let's take a look at the REST proxy and see what's the difference in using a REST proxy and HTTP calls in order to interact with the Kafka system versus doing event streaming. And the fourth will be the actual uh, REST endpoints that are built into the Kafka brokers themselves. So let's get started uh, with request response. And a little bit like Ido's uh, sync versus async talk earlier this morning, you know, request response is a HTTP call. And your client sends a request and waits for a response. And you're really notifying something that should happen on the system. These are generally fairly low latency. They're typically point to point. Uh, there's, a, there's, there's usually a presumption of a response. Um, and, uh, and it uses a predefined API. You need to know what it is you're going to do in advance and have that API available. This compares with event streaming. Um, and event streaming is really uh, more a case of continuous processing. Um, so messages are received into a queue, or as we call it in Kafka, a topic. And basically, the data writer or the producer drops the message, and it doesn't care when that's going to be processed. It, it may or may not be consumed later, and it might be consumed by one or many consumers. The producer doesn't care. Um, and, you're, and the producer is really notifying something that has already happened, um, and that's generally the contents of the, of the message. This is continuous processing. It's often referred to as event-driven. Um, there's no presumption of a response. Uh, you know, so it drops the message into the topic and moves on and drops the next message into a topic. It doesn't care uh, who consumes that. And these are often used for sort of general purposes purpose events. So um, how do you weigh up which, which of these two schemes to use? Um, and perhaps looking at the challenges is a good way of sort of evaluating these. Um, with request response, it's difficult to enforce standards across services. I know that you know, I work at a bank that have built their entire mobile banking application using request response. And it's relatively easy to get started. But as the system matures and complexity grows, it you know, some real challenges emerge. Um, with keeping the uh, point three here, the inter-service dependencies um, across all of the services. Scaling can be challenging. You know, if you're deploying in Dockerized containers or on Kubernetes, you have an easy way of scaling up more and more client services. And it's important that, that you're also able to scale the calls back to your uh, Kafka system uh, in a similar manner. Um, the services themselves are required to maintain state. So as, as values are returned from Kafka and that require, need to be stored in various variables, the, uh, you know, it's the, the client application is responsible for doing this. Um, and if it's a multi-threaded application, this, this gets more complex. Um, and also just the, the general complexity of, of deploying these types of applications um, and uh, you know, requires some form of load balancing. Uh, you know, as, as, Idi, as Ido said earlier in his talk, you know, sometimes this is seen as a sort of a, a, a 
you know, um, not considered a modern way of building applications. It's not entirely fair. There are cases where it really makes more sense to use uh, a request response type scheme. So the challenges of doing things uh, with Kafka are sometimes the infrastructure on the client side can get more complex as, as you think about things like your service goals, your delivery guarantees, fault tolerance, retries, things like that. Um, event thinking in general is hard. So adopting the Kafka way to do this, uh, you can you can sort of you know design this yourself, or you can look for thought leaders on how this uh, how this can be done. Th uh, th um, I was going uh, the uh, ThoughtWorks are a great consultancy company uh, that lead sort of lead the way on uh, on event streaming, and you'll find a lot of material in our blog as well on the different ways of doing this. So which scheme to use? Um, and, and when is it a better choice to use HTTP uh, to interact with Kafka? Let's take a look at three categories of uh, three categories of reasons for doing this. The first is on the management plane. Um, it makes sense to use HTTP calls in order to interact with your cluster on the management plane. So management of your Kafka topics and consumer groups and access control lists and things like that, because these are generally fairly low volume and low intensity calls. Um, and if you're doing CICD and DevOps integration, if you're using GitHub or ServiceNow or any of these sorts of services and you want to be able to automate creation of topics and schemas and ACLs and all that sort of stuff, makes a lot of sense to use the HTTP APIs for this. The second, on the data plane, if you're dealing with a mobile application, this is actually quite a natural fit for request response as well. Um, so, and often, uh, often mobile applications will use web sockets and sort of server send events. It's somewhat unusual for a mobile application to connect directly to a Kafka server, but there are instances. Um, and often, you know, you could swap out mobile applications for sort of devices if that's if that's your current architecture. So legacy applications, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes uh, you know offbeat middleware. If you're trying to sort of code something in a client that does not have an approved Kafka client or any Kafka client or something that you don't trust, then it, then it can make more sense to use this. Uh, you know, we have uh, we we work with various companies across the region that, particularly with SAP systems, PI and PO, uh, it makes a lot of sense to to call these services. Um, uh, using the REST proxy and then pass payloads from Kafka topics in and out of the REST interfaces for these services. If you use an API gateway, so MuleSoft or Kong or uh, Apigee, these types of systems, um, and, and the, the, the development preference in your organization is to do as much as possible via the API gateway, then it obviously makes sense to do things using HTTP. Um, and finally, what if you're just using other languages where you have minimal support for Kafka client? So COBOL or ABAP or Erlang, Kotlin, th there's various levels of uh, Kafka client support for these. Um, so uh, you, you may prefer to use HTTP. And then the other reasons for opting for HTTP could be technology lock-in. Um, there are companies that, that don't want to be tied to Java or .NET or Python uh, or Go and they want to um, keep everything as HTTP. Um, and generally familiarity, you know, uh, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's an easier leap to request response than it is to event streaming, particularly if you're coming from a database development background. So it seems more familiar to simply adopt request response than to go with event streaming. Uh, securing HTTP ports is just easier. Um, you know, it's more challenging to set up uh, uh, authentication and encryption when you're communicating uh, sort of event streaming communication via uh, TCP. Um, and finally, if, you're, if you have adopted a uh, particular domain-driven design paradigm, then you may well use both. Okay, So you might be using HTTP for some synchronous stuff, um, and then sort of use a Kafka pro protocol and a framework wherever possible for decoupling. Uh, and often these are combined with a service mesh. So you could be using something like Istio um, in order to combine both paradigms into a single uh, mesh. So that really were, were the um, sort of decision points about which, uh, which to use, uh, HTTP or sort of the Kafka native client. So let's talk about some of the actual REST APIs that are available for Kafka. Now, some of these are on Kafka. Some are on uh, Confluent Community, which you can download. And it's a, it's a community uh, platform that includes the, the current release of Apache Kafka, along with a whole bunch of other uh, community licensed services. There's no license obligations. Or, well, there's a license obligation, but there's no, there's no charges or anything to use this. And the Confluent Community Edition is very widely used. And then there's, of course, the Confluent Enterprise Edition. So we're going to be looking at three of these. The REST Proxy, uh, which comes under the community license, the Confluent Broker REST, 
which comes under the enterprise and Confluent Cloud REST API. We look at that one very briefly as well. So first, a REST proxy. Um, so it's a RESTful interface uh, for an Apache Kafka cluster. It runs on its own, generally a pair of VMs. Uh, so uh, both services will start up, they will cluster, connect to the brokers, and then they will wait for REST calls from your application. So uh, the example I gave earlier is a, is a company that uses a lot of SAP, PI, and PO. And from their ABAP program, they make calls to the REST endpoint in order to produce and consume back to Kafka topics. Um, so you can produce and consume messages, you know, which is the main thing that you want the Kafka cluster to do. Um, you can view the metadata of the cluster, and you can perform various administrative actions. Uh, the metadata plane are managing and viewing status on your brokers, topics, consumer groups, and ACLs. This is generally used if you're building some sort of an internal uh, portal for for event streaming in your company, right? If you want to be able to uh, for a, a place where you can go to create, where users can create topics, define their schema, set up their ACLs, and all that, then it would make sense to do all of this via the REST proxy. And on the data plane, uh, so being able to produce and consume. Uh, at scale for for your various topics, including quite complex produce and consume patterns using consumer groups, uh, using multiple topics, and and all of these sorts of patterns. Um, so uh, generally, uh, I recommend that start with two VMs or Docker containers in your REST proxy, um, and then consider and just scale that out uh, as you need to. When you add the third, you get 33% more capacity. Add a fourth, you get 25% more capacity, and so on. Um, so that's, that was the first uh, option to interact uh, via REST with your system. The second is a Confluent Broker REST. So um, these are this is a REST port that runs on the broker. So if you're already a Kafka user, you're probably familiar with port 9092, which is the uh, traditional, uh, sorry, the default port for producing and consuming to the broker. There are other ports that you can enable and open on your brokers. And one of those is the broker REST port. Um, and something like the REST proxy, uh, it, it allows you to do quite a lot of metadata uh, interaction with your Kafka cluster. So uh, bro uh, broadly across these categories, you can describe, list, and configure your brokers, and so on. Uh, you will notice that these are all uh, metadata-related categories. There's no data produce and consume here. That's coming soon. Um, so then it will be possible uh, for, for those of you that run the Confluence system, um, it will be possible to um, to produce and consume over REST to the brokers without having any additional VMs or Docker services running. And uh, just very briefly on the Confluent Cloud REST API. So Confluent Cloud is our serverless uh, offering uh, that lets you run Apache Kafka on your cloud provider of choice in your region of choice, where you don't have to manage brokers or zookeepers or anything like that. So this was launched. the, the, the uh, Confluent Cloud has been around for quite some time. Uh, so we launched REST APIs for cloud um, in February. Uh, metadata still, so connectors, users, and service accounts and environments, like prod test dev, that sort of thing. Um, and we will soon be adding metadata management for topics and ACLs and consumer lag. So if you have uh, GitHub workflows that you have built for Apache Kafka, it's relatively easy to switch these over to uh, Confluent Cloud if you ever wanted to use a serverless version um, and just swap those calls out for the REST API calls on Confluent Cloud. And we have published the API for the Confluent Cloud uh, REST APIs. Um, so you can just sort of Google that and take a look and see, uh, drill down a bit and see what are the um, the various calls that you can make. Um, I never really got into the REST gateways today. So things like MuleSoft and Apigee and Kong and all that, because that is really a whole other way of interacting with your Kafka system over REST. It's a, it's a, it would it's, it would take more than 20 minutes. My colleague Kai has uh, blogged on this uh, on a, a few different times. So I do recommend taking a look at this particular blog post. Uh, and if this is an area of interest for you, please get in touch with me. Um, and just as I finish, you know, there's exciting news last night for the people in the Apache Kafka world. So Kafka AK 2.8 was released. Um, and this has been long awaited because it's the version with no, it's the preview version with no zookeeper. So the, the the consensus is built into the Kafka brokers, and you no longer have a dependence on a second uh, second uh, cluster bunch of cluster nodes uh, for Zookeeper. Um, so you can take a look at the YouTube video that Tim released overnight, uh, just announcing uh, Kip 500 with the uh, with the Zookeeper removal and a bunch of other features that are available with uh, Apache Kafka 
2.8. And that concludes my talk. Uh, I'm just on time. Uh, as I say, there's my contact details. Uh, you can read tn at confluent.io is probably the easiest way to reach me uh, or ping me on LinkedIn uh, if that's what you want to do. And we have time for questions. Prasant. Uh, yeah. hey, thanks, Mark, for this uh, wonderful session. Uh, just uh, uh, one question. Um, so which are the industries um, that are adopting an event-driven architecture uh, more when compared to others? Who are the leaders and the, who are the laggards there, actually? Right? Um, I think the, the two categories that really stand out uh, are financial services, in particular retail banking, because okay. event streaming really fits into uh, the, the architecture for mobile banking and just being able to ship a very rich data set to, to, uh, to phones and mobile banking applications. Ka uh, event streaming in Kafka is a very natural fit for this world. And increasingly, we're doing a lot of um, sort of integration with mainframe core banking systems. So the big old IBM systems and trying to uh, stream data from these systems out to digital banking applications. So that's one. The second category is no big surprise, digital native companies. So the ride sharing companies, food delivery, because um, these companies uh, ship tremendous amounts of data around and, and really data in motion is, is really what it's all about uh, for, for quality of user experience. These are the big categories. We're starting to see more emerge in manufacturing and insurance and utilities. I think these are the areas that uh, you'll see much more in event streaming over the next year or two. Okay. So, uh, and, uh, and or of, about the new organizations or from the traditional industries, the organizations who are moving into the event-driven architecture currently. So where do you see the push coming from? Is it again, like many in many organizations, the APIs are predominantly driven from the business side than from the technical side. So is it a similar thing in the, for the event-driven architecture also, or is it more driven by the technical team? No, I, I think it's large. I think it's a desire to modernize platforms. Um, th many of these are industries that are running on legacy systems. Legacy systems are still going to be around for years, if not decades. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, and, and APIs offer uh, offer an interface to to sort of link the the legacy world with the uh, much more um, agile microservice world. Um, so yeah, I think uh, APIs are really the glue between these two types of platforms. Um, and, and Kafka has become sort of a de facto platform for sharing data between uh, uh, sort of legacy and, and microservice-based platforms. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Mark. Thank uh, you very much. That's fine. Yeah, thank you. Joining us next on technical stage is Ming Wen. From Apache, he's the API uh, Apache API six PMC chair at Apache Software Foundation. Uh, the focus of the session will be oh. next generation microservice architecture based on Apache oh. API six. <clears throat> Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Mm -hmm. Can you put your slide into the presentation mode? And share. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Me. I can. Okay, okay. It's my time, right? Yes. Uh, <clears> can you share okay. the screen? Your yeah, slide is not yeah. visible. Can you see my slides? Yes. Yes, yes I can. Okay. 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 <clears throat> okay. Hello. Over to you. Okay. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm very happy to be here, have the opportunity to talk about uh, uh, API in API days. Uh, today, my topic is the uh, uh, next generation microservice architecture based on Apache API 6. Uh, first, let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm Ming Wen. I come from China. Uh, I'm the co-founder and the CEO of uh, Apache API 6, uh, of CEO of API 7.net, AI, which is an open source startup company. I'm also the VP and the PMC chair of Apache API 6, and I'm the uh, scalping committer. OK. <clears throat> uh, I'm the founder of the Chihu C360 open source committee, Tencent Cloud TVP, and I have, I have more than 40 security patent. Um, let me introduce my, uh, our open source startup company first. Uh, we raised 10 millions of dollars in last year. Uh, we hope to use Apache API 6 to connect all services 
the north source traffic of the API gateway, Kubernetes traffic of ingress controller, and the east west traffic between services. Yes, uh, I think it's mean all L7 traffic. Uh, in our company, most engineers are Apache committer. We hear them from the Apache 6 uh, community. Uh, what's more worth motion is that we use many great tools to help us to uh, work from uh, home. Yes, we remote work, including the GitHub, Slack, Google Workspace, and the Tencent meeting. Uh, the engineers can, uh, can have the work-life balance in our company. So you can reach me by this email. Uh, in today's topic, I will introduce uh, two parts. Uh, the first one is a brief introduction of the Apache API 6. What is Apache API 6? Maybe you don't know, you never heard about it. And uh, what can Apache API 6 help us to deal with? Um, and the second part is why API 6, we call that is the next generation API gateway. What's the difference between API 6 and uh, other similar API gateways. Uh, if, if we still have time, uh, we have another question and uh, answer session. Okay, let's go through today's topic. Uh, the first part is I will introduce the Apache API 6. First of all, let me briefly introduce Apache API 6. In one um, sentence, API 6 is a cloud native API gateway. Yes, uh, here is a report address of API 6 on GitHub. Apache API 6 is a very young project. It was open sourced uh, almost two years ago, and we donate uh, API 6 to the Apache incubator in October. And uh, in, in July 2020, API 6 became a top level project of Apache Software Foundation. So API 6 is a very fast growing community. It only took nine months from the incubator to Apache top level project. Uh, for developers who are not familiar with Apache API 6, you can similar think uh, API 6 is a better version of Nginx, which covers all features of Nginx while using Lula to bring more dynamic features to Nginx. Uh, API 6, uh, uh, you can think it's uh, like a uh, very powerful uh, API gateway based on Nginx. Um, also, we use Nginx as our base, but API 6 discard Nginx's uh, road matching status configurations and C modules. We don't use that. API 6, we write all of them by ourselves. So API 6 is uh, uh, I think API 6 is power than Nginx because it's all dynamic in API 6. It's also the biggest feature of API 6 is dynamic. All things in API 6 it can uh, configuration uh, through the, the main API, the RESTful API, including routing, SSL cert, plugin, etc. In Apache API 6, all features a dynamic config through the admin API without restart the service and all. In Apache API 6, users' business need, needs all realized by using Lula to develop customer plugins. API 6 now has more than 40 built-in plugins, including uh, all uh, limit rate, limit request, security, observability, logging metrics, Etc., uh, which base covers all the features that user may use in the enterprise. In one word, I think API 6 is uh, powered than Kong, and Kong is already cover all features of Nginx. So welcome to try API 6 if you want to use uh, API 6 as an API gateway. Um, this is a technical architecture of Apache API 6. Mm, from this, we can see that API 6 has two parts. Uh, the left one is the data plan, and the right one is the control plan. So let's first look at the data plan. After the user's request is processed through the 
Apache API 6. Mm, it can be passed to the uh, backend uh, services like the private API, public API, or partners API. Uh, inside the API 6, the plugins are uh, built in a way similar to Lego bricks. You can easily remove or add a plugin without restart the service. Then let's look at the control plan. In the control plan, uh, the administrator can write the configurations to the etcd cluster through the admin API. And then API 6 data plan will watch etcd so that the configurations can reach all data plans with uh, million seconds. After the node of the data plan process the data, then they uh, report some metrics and the logging data to components such as skywalking, uh, zipkin, etc. Uh, from this, uh, from this picture, we can see that API six only relates uh, on etcd. So uh, API six does not have RDS like MySQL or Postgres. API six don't relate the this component this database. Therefore, API six is uh, uh, better designed for high available. At the same time, API 6 also keeps simple for development and ops. Uh, then let's take a look at what can API 6 do for you. API 6 can handle uh, L4 and uh, L7 traffics. So include uh, the HTTP, HTTPS, TCP, UDP, MQTT, and other protocols. So you can use API 6 to uh, handle the traffic from the uh, IoT drivers or uh, your mobile phone client. So at the same time, uh, API 6 can also play as the role of load balance. Um, it's similar to the i5 and Nginx. Of course, API 6 are, is also an API gateway. API 6 can do all jobs about load balance and other features of API gateway. Uh, apart from this, API 6 can also uh, play as Kubernetes ingress controller. You can visit this open source project to get more information. And, least, but not the, uh, and last but not the least, we can also use API 6 in service mesh. Um, API 6 can work with Istio because API 6 mesh support XDS APIs. Therefore, API 6 can help you to handle all traffic from the client to service. You don't need to care about whether traffic is come from the mobile phone, it's come from the uh, service, whether it's the east-west or north-south traffic. API 6 can handle all L7 traffic. Uh, this picture is the landscape of Apache API 6. Look at this from the left. API 6 supports uh, many uh, L4 and uh, L7 protocols. It not only supports traffic from uh, the mobile APP, but also supports various of, uh, IoT drivers to uh, report traffic to mm -hmm. API 6. API 6 also supports many service uh, discovery centers, including the ETCD, console, Nichols, and other uh, discovery centers. As a very important uh, in infrastructure software, API Gateway is general place and the entrance of traffic. Therefore, uh, API Gateway is not only need to process all requests from client, but also need to connect, connect to some backend services such as Skywalking, Daydog, Kafka, etc. Uh, and at the bottom of this picture, API 6 uh, not, not only support running on the uh, VM, but also can run on the public clouds. We also support running API 6 on ARM platform. Uh, and the, and the hundreds of companies are already using Apache API 6. Uh, for example, uh, in China, when you buy uh, uh, air ticket, or you buy new tea, watch news, online videos, um, or online educations, 
Apache PI6 is working behind them. So it's well used in China. Uh, and the Europe factory platform and NASA are also use, uh, are, are also users of API 6. If you want a great API gateway, you can make a try. And this picture compares some well-known API gateways. Uh, they are, all of them are open source project such as API 6, Glue, TYK, and Kong. Um, contributors are the king of the open source projects, in my opinion. Uh, more contributors, the more popular and uh, stable. From this picture, we can see that the growth of Apache API 6 contributor is uh, fasted. Uh, also, API 6 is the youngest uh, open source project of, of all of them. According to this growth, API 6 will be the open source API gateway project with the most contributors in this year. Developers are the easiest to discover the best technologies so you can follow their choice. So let's talk about uh, why I think API 6 will be the next generation API gateway. Um, API Gateway should not just uh, do the load balance work and, and not just the reverse proxy. API Gateway should not only for traffic. Um, under cloud native, companies will deploy APIs and services in public cloud, on-premise, or hybrid cloud. API Gateway should be able to connect their APIs and services together um, whatever this API come from. Enterprise users don't need to care about where these API are deployed, just use them. Uh, once, one step forward, where we are process the traffic, uh, can we analyze the data in this traffic? If we can analyze the data and the response in real time to the client, it will bring more valuable to the business. And more, and the micro microservice architecture, we will have hundreds or thousands of microservices. While processing their traffic between services, uh, we also need to let developers know the running status of their services. We call that observability. So API Gateway need to record their metrics, logging, tracing data, and send them to the backend services. For example, Skywalking, Zipkin. Finally, as API Gateway become more and more important in the microservice architecture, not only developers need to do the customer development, sometimes uh, product managers, security team, and the ops also need to use API Gateway. So how API Gateway uh, helps them? I think API Gateway should friendly for all of them. It's not easy to do all of the above. Um, API 6 has made some try and we'll, I will introduce it below. Um, there, uh, there are a lot of open source projects for L7 traffic. Uh, also, they have different names such as load balance and service mesh or Kubernetes ingress controller. But now let me uh, simply think that they are all API gateways. Uh, absolutely it's not correct, but just for a uh, better understanding because most of those features are the same. H uh, Nginx, we know that Nginx can handle north source traffic and Envoy can handle east west traffic. And in Kubernetes, there is an ingress uh, controller. In many banks, they use uh, Java Spring Cloud Gateway to handle their traffic between the services. Yes, uh, there, there is also has service mesh. So from, the, from so you know, there are so many components like uh, API gateways. The traffic journey of the client the request is very long. And uh, are they all necessary? Uh, and I don't think so. Why not use only one solution 
for the load balance, API Gateway, Kubernetes, Ingress Controller, and the Service Mesh, which means load development, uh, load development and uh, uh, low cost. But how to do that? Um, how to do that with one solution, one uniform solution? So, uh, so we want to use API 6 to, to do this. This picture on the left is the status now with many different components. There are Nginx, Kong, Envoy, uh, Java Spring, Go uh, uh, Java Spring uh, Cloud Gateway, uh, Zoe, you can ask for in our systems. The picture on the right is a solution of API 6. Let's look down from the top. API 6 is based on Nginx, yes. So API 6 can replace Nginx for load balance and a very low cost. API 6 is designed as a cloud native API gateway. So the location of the API gateway is not a problem. Kubernetes ingress controller mean really on the data plan. So it's all feature, it's not difficult. We can also use API 6 to do that. And I think the real challenges are Java Spring Cloud Gateway and the Service Mesh. API 6 will support Java to uh, Java and Golang to write customer plugins. So I think you can use API 6 uh, works very well with the uh, Java ecosystems. Now we will talk about uh, uh, Service Mesh later. Uh, for business users, performance is not the key, but uh, if you want to face all environments, performance cannot be ignored. API 6 performance has always been its advantage. Uh, in the case of very high QPS, API 6 can also stay a uh, very low latency. In our public benchmark report, API 6 is 10 times than other API gateway projects. Uh, in the case of your high traffic, good performance can help you to, this, uh, to save cost. And then let, let's talk about developer. Uh, more developers means more contributions and uh, more company use and uh, more stable. So we can see that the open source projects of API gateway support more popular program languages to write the custom plugins. For Kong, Lula is a native plugin program language and also support uh, Golang. C++ is a native plugin program language for Envoy. And uh, Envoy is also support Lula and uh, Wasa. And Envoy is uh, ready to support Golang. API 6 support Lula uh, will also support uh, and uh, API 6 will support uh, Java, Golang, and uh, WebAssembly. Uh, support more and more programming languages in API Gateway. So I think it's very interesting. Um, we know that the core of Kong, Envoy, and API 6 are written by C or C++ programming languages. <clears throat> um, but at the same time, uh, Kong, API 6, and Envoy, all support more popular and more easy use program languages to write custom plugins. The development of API Gateway is getting easier and easier. I think it's a good thing. Uh, finally, uh, let's look ahead to how to let more people use the API Gateway. Uh, how does the uh, product manager and the ops write plugins for API Gateway? Both of them don't know how to program and you cannot let them to learn how to code. So API 6 support uh, plugin orchestration. Um, uh, um, so you can use the exist uh, plugins to make a, a new plugin just uh, through the GUI. Uh, like children learn program language from the sketch. So I think the bar is very low. You can see a demo on our set, uh, you can see a demo on our website. Uh, this feature is also open sourced, so you can enjoy it. Okay, let's review today's topic. Uh, we use Apache API 6 to implement a solution. 
for processing all L7 traffic with very good performance and all features of north source and the east-west traffic. Uh, Zen API 6 keeps a low bar and the and the easy way for everyone to use. We support more popular program languages and uh, even the local. Uh, there are features that API 6 already has. As a fast growing open source project and a community, Apache API 6 will add more features. More features. We hope API 6 is the best choice for the cloud native. So if, I, if you are interested in API 6, uh, please take a look and the GitHub repo. Okay, thank you. Hi, Ming. Uh, it's moving on to yes. the Q&A. Uh, moving on to the okay. Q&A, there is one question. Uh, how does API 6 implement dynamic SSL certificate? Uh, okay. Uh, API 6 is based on Nginx, and we use the Lula uh, uh, inside the API 6. So we use the Lula to control the Nginx's, Nginx. So I think uh, all the dynamic features are uh, implemented by the Lula VM in the Nginx. Uh, maybe you can um, take a look at the OpenST. So OpenST is also the uh, core of API 6. We do that based on operacity. Okay. So, uh, what is the lead time to uh, production for a somebody who is adopting API 6? How much time it will uh, take? Uh, they from the, uh, uh, they want to, they already use Nginx, so they want to use API 6 now. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think uh, for most uh, users, the cost is very low because um, our Nginx configurations can write in the API, API 6 directly, yes. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Ming. Uh, thanks for the wonderful session. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah, all the best on the project. <laughs> Wishing all the success. Okay, thank you. see you. Moving on to the next session on this stage, uh, we'll be joined by Lumunto Luhur, API Product Manager at Zendit. Uh, he will be talking to us about the journey to standardize APIs in a fast-growing startup. Yeah, um, thanks, Prasan, for the introduction. Hi, yeah, hi, uh, hi, API Disk Global. Um, so yeah, today. Uh, I'm honored to uh, to share uh, some journey of uh, standardizing APS at Sandit. But uh, yeah, first of all, uh, let me quickly introduce myself. So uh, I'm Luminto. I'm uh, from Medan, North Sumatra, Indonesia, and I'm currently uh, still uh, work from home uh, in Jakarta. Um, I'm currently uh, working as an API product manager at Sandit. So uh, I basically uh, help to prioritize. Uh, uh, business requirements uh, also manage uh, the scope of the API team, which is uh, which includes uh, API management, API design, uh, webhook, OAuth, uh, API reference, uh, and libraries and SDKs to provide a great uh, developer experience to our customers. And then, yeah, some fun facts about me. Uh, yeah, I'm obsessed about product, building product, um, API, productivity tools, and also well-being uh, like meditation. So yeah, nice to meet you all. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, uh, the outline of this uh, session uh, is quite uh, simple. So I'll share a, a, I quickly share a bit uh, about context and history, uh, so that you can uh, get the full context uh, of the uh, topic today. And then uh, I will also share about the journey and then uh, some key takeaways that you can uh, uh, take away uh, from this session. And then, yeah, so uh, let's jump in, like context and history. So uh, just a quick introduction of Sandit. Um, so uh, uh, Sandit is basically like Stripe for Southeast Asia in Indonesia and Philippines. So we prof uh, we are uh, a payment gateway that provides uh, payment methods to uh, a B2B pay payment gateway pro that provides uh, payment method to custom to our merchants. 
uh, such as uh, like send payments, uh, which is uh, like e-wallets, um, uh, virtual accounts, and then cards. And then we also also have money out uh, products uh, uh, like disbursements and remittance. So uh, yeah, basically uh, that's uh, what it, uh, the company are focusing on. And then uh, yeah, if, uh, most and, and most of our products are uh, based on API. So it's about uh, eighty percent of our uh, products are based on API. Uh, so uh, standardizing uh, the APIs are, are, are very important, and yeah, API are in the core of our heart. So yeah, and uh, yeah, we have a bunch of API to support uh, those uh, uh, products that we have. So uh, for example, like I mentioned before, like cards, e-wallet, and uh, direct debit, and and so on. So, uh, but. Uh, to jump back uh, in history, uh, in 2019, um, we we was a team of only uh, 80 plus people uh, back then, and then uh, because uh, each product are being uh, handled by a different team, um, so uh, they are kind of uh, developing the product in their own way, and then a few customers express uh, like some confusion of uh, some of our APIs due to some inconsistency, um, and then yeah, uh, back then we also. Uh, don't have any processes uh, or even uh, mindset uh, or even uh, API design guideline to help us to uh, to solve the problem of uh, customers' confusion due to inconsistency. Yeah. Uh, fast forward uh, now. Uh, yeah, we we grow. I uh, think uh, five times already. Uh, now we we are at uh, four hundred plus people, uh, and uh, we managed to have. Um, to have refreshed uh, and standardized um, most of our APIs already since then. Uh, and then uh, we also have a, a place in API design process and guideline uh, available for teams to uh, be able to refer to. So, uh, but the, the journey uh, for, for the past two years, uh, something that I would like to share, uh, yeah, because uh, most textbooks or articles uh, uh, they, they, they are great uh, to share academic knowledge, uh, which I will explain uh, later on, but a uh, few share their journey and pain points and processes to get there. So uh, I, I hope uh, this session will be helpful for you. Yeah, yeah. so for the journey itself, um, so basically uh, we, have, uh, we have the problem uh, where uh, the, uh, some of our customers uh, express confusion. So uh, basically, we, uh, we, we just want to uh, design a simple and easy to use and consistent APIs so that we can make our customer job uh, easier, better, and quicker. So that's, uh, uh, so that's the, uh, the goal. Uh, the goal is to make our customer job uh, easier and also quicker uh, to integrate with our APIs. Yeah, and then uh, in order to do so, uh, I also, um, learn from uh, tick.io. So I think uh, uh, one of the article mentioned that, uh, yeah, uh, quote uh, here, uh, which is once your API has been officially released and integrated with your first stakeholder, your API design is forever, forever. So getting it right the first time is very important. Yeah, uh, well, uh, uh, technically you can also do versioning, but uh, it's, it's better if you uh, design it uh, correctly in the first attempt so that the cost to change uh, will uh, uh, will not uh, mount it. Yeah. So yeah. Um, so the uh, to explain the journey to get uh, to the state we are in today. So uh, uh, we uh, I separate uh, into three area of focus uh, to to make it more digestible. So uh, we, we will have a people uh, process and technology as usual. So uh, yeah, within uh, this area of focus, um, yeah, we uh, usually the approach that we uh, take and uh, quite kind of success until now is that we start small and then iterate from there. So uh, I will uh, on the on the next slides, uh, I will explain uh, slowly one by one uh, which uh, the the area of focus uh, that we uh, tackle on on the journey. Yeah, I think starting from the technology first because that's the easiest thing um, uh, from from the rest of two. So uh, when you uh, set set up the technology, actually there are a lot of great tools out, out there that you can use to be able to um, 
to able to be able to standardize your API. So um, the first one, obviously, you need to have a API design guideline so that the entire organization will refer to the guideline to be able to design the APIs correctly and uh, also find what are the standards uh, that uh, we are agreed to and also the naming conventions. And then uh, once you have those uh, guidelines, uh, uh, when you, you uh, will design an API, uh, you can also use uh, OS. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, everyone is uh, familiar with OS, uh, Open API Specification. Basically, this is a, like a YAML or JSON file uh, to be able to uh, write down the API description and specification. Yeah, so so yeah, uh, you can use this this uh, OS, and then uh, yeah, uh, and then when you uh, translate those APIs into OS, um, then um, you can e either use a Swagger Hub or Stoplight. Uh, not sponsored, but uh, I find uh, these uh, tools are really helpful to uh, for me to be able to uh, define the OS. Uh, yeah, because they have the great UI. Yeah, and uh, I don't have to uh, write YAML or uh, JSON file manually. So yeah, um, this uh, technology are the easiest. Um, yeah, and then uh, once you got uh, once you got this as your foundation, um, then uh, I would recommend you to the uh, to go to the next stage, uh, which is the uh, sorry um, the the API design guideline. So the next one, um, so when you de define the API design guideline, um, standard is very important. So we want to make sure that um, all standards have been defined and also captured in a single uh, document. Yeah, so for example, like API first, how, how will you, uh, how uh, are we as an organization will uh, tackle or define the standard for API versioning? And then uh, what about pagination? Uh, what about uh, the error experience? Um, rate limit, error structure, file upload, sort. Uh, there are a lot of things here. So uh, I won't be covered uh, one by one, but uh, uh, these are the uh, items that are uh, important to be uh, defined as a standard so that the uh, the rest of the organization uh, can refer to uh, them. Uh, but yeah, just to give, give a, a general principles that I use, uh, to set standard, uh, basically uh, the first principle is that uh, we want to focus on users' perspective. Yeah, so uh, we want to avoid uh, um, designing from our perspective, which can uh, lead to uh, a bi cognitive bias and uh, not producing a easy and simple APIs to customers. So that's the first principle. The second pr uh, principle to set standard is uh, to document the standard into a document. Uh, or you can use, also use a uh, GitHub README, and then the the, the third uh, principle is to uh, have a name naming convention, so that uh, what will you name a certain concept uh, that needs to be agreed uh, that needs to be agreed to across all uh, teams and product teams, um, so that the customers uh, uh, will not find uh, inconsistency uh, about naming uh, on your APIs. And actually, the, the the naming convention is the hardest one, uh, uh, and we 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 argue a lot. Uh, what will be the best naming? But uh, that uh, those healthy debate are very helpful, um, so that we can produce a simple and easy to use API for customers. Yeah, um, and then uh, just quick tips on uh, defining standards. Uh, just quickly, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, why standard is important uh, is because uh, it increases uh, predictability so that uh, customers can predict uh, what uh, will be the, like, let's say, the, na the naming on other APIs. And then uh, second one, uh, sec second tips is that, yeah, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, you can use uh, global standards that exist um, on the internet, uh, for example, like ISO, RFCs, etc. Like for example, uh, like ISO 8601 for date and time format, ISO 4217 for currency, and so on. So you can use the, uh, those global standards and uh, yeah, don't need to reinvent the wheel. And then it also increases uh, predictability for your customers. The second, uh, yeah, uh, another tips is that yeah, define the style guides like um, like um, the. Um, like avoid technical jargon. Uh, you don't want to mention, uh, for example, in credit cards, uh, you have a uh, abbreviation of PAN, uh, which stands for primary account number, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, it's a bit technical and uh, well known in 
credit card industry, uh, but for a regular merchants or customers who are not uh, from credit card industry, they might find it um, unfamiliar. So we uh, we can re rebrand or, or rename it into uh, like card number, as simple as credit card number to be able to uh, express that the concept of a credit card number and also amount should provide currency and so on. And then uh, next, uh, last is about uh, the API interaction standard. Uh, for example, like uh, how will you do uh, item potence? Uh, how long will you store um, the item potency key in your system? Uh, what about rate limit? Um, what will be the experience of throttling? And then uh, what will be the filter sort pagination and inter interactions on the APIs for customers? Yeah, and many more. Yeah, and yeah, uh, those are quick tips uh, that uh, we learned. Uh, obviously, this information can be found in internet. Uh, so yeah, don't reinvent the wheel, uh, and it will increase predictability. And then last, uh, yeah, uh, uh, try to understand uh, what we will uh, uh, be copied to. So um, so yeah, the, don't copy literally. So try to understand um, the uh, why the uh, the standard the global standard exists, and then uh, whether it can fit to your customers' need. Yeah. Yep. Uh, the second part of the journey after we have talked with uh, the technology and the standards is the is people influencing people. Um, I found that this is the most overlooked uh, and the, the most difficult one uh, to influence people because uh, we have to change the mindset and it's yeah, it takes time. Uh, it it takes effort, time, and energy to be able to do so. So yeah, um, you need. Uh, to influence uh, um, the team with the yeah, design first approach uh, to leaderships, uh, product teams, developers to get buy-ins, and then shift people mindset to focus on uh, user perspective. Um, and then uh, you also need to train the uh, people uh, to be able to learn about API design process, which I will be uh, info uh, uh, ex um, elaborate soon. Yeah, but uh, the key takeaway here is that um, uh, if you are from a code first approach, uh, you need to influence uh, the product teams, the developers to be uh, to be able to start from design first approach, yeah, so that we can solve the problem of the inconsistency and be able to standardize the APIs. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, empathize with use uh, train people. Uh, so this is the same um, uh, point here. I uh, just make it uh, more easy uh, to uh, be digest. So yeah, train people to have the design first mindset. And then uh, focus and empathize uh, on user perspective, and then yeah, as usual, start small and iterate. Yeah. And then uh, once you we have influenced the uh, the people, uh, which takes time, cost, and energy. Uh, the next one is uh, to set up a process um, uh, within the org itself. So um, beforehand on. Uh, during 2019, we don't have any API design process, so uh, team uh, teams were designing uh, APIs by themselves, and then re uh, resulted in producing uh, inconsistency API uh, suits uh, that we produce to customers. So uh, at the moment, we have the API design process, and uh, wow, well, uh, and uh, it is enforced uh, within the org. So whenever we need to uh, produce a public facing APIs, especially the public facing APIs. Uh, the teams needs to uh, get approval from the API team um, by uh, designing, reviewing, and iterating together with the customers. And then uh, once uh, the, the API has been uh, designed then, uh, and approved, then uh, by then uh, the teams can, can start to implement uh, those API, API, develop, and then release uh, those API to customers. So that, that's the API design process. Uh, that we have right now, and then um, uh, we we I also find um, when you set up processes, um, especially uh, when you are dealing with uh, making decisions for standardization, it's very important. And naming convention, it's very important to uh, identify decision makers, like who will make the uh, de decision on certain area, so that there's no congestion on uh, decision making. Uh, process so uh, being able to identify the decision makers will help uh, the process to, uh, to go smoothly uh, and then the third one is that yeah um, yeah um, most of 
the things um, are not we are not very familiar with uh, most of the things back back in 2019 so it will definitely take time and uh, research uh, to be able to produce a great re result but yeah just uh, the number three point is that uh, if you are doing research uh, for some unknown things yeah uh, make sure that you time box decision making um, yeah so that um, so that it can provide a, a certain timeline to stakeholders and then uh, they can expect um but uh, when they should uh, contact uh, you and follow up with you again yeah uh, then that actually leads to point number four which is um to provide transparent timeline to stakeholders yeah so they are not uh waiting uh unknowingly uh, about the timeline and then this also give assurance for stakeholders which is very important uh um to manage stakeholders properly yeah and then last but not least yeah um because uh if especially if you are starting from scratch uh, where you did not have any uh, ABI design guideline uh, uh, it's very important to accommodate those research time um, research time so you want to endorse uh, the product teams to start early so that you have time to be able to iterate uh, with customers as well to produce a great API so yeah uh, these processes uh, and uh, changing mindset um, from influencing people are not uh, instant. It took us two years uh, plus. Until now, uh, we are still we are not we are nowhere perfect uh, per se. We are keep, we are continuously uh, iterating on uh, our processes and also our design uh, our API design process. Uh, but um, but yeah, uh, these are the things that I would like to share. Uh, if you uh, if you will probably have a scalable problem where uh, team, you have like one team who like each team who design their own API and then produce inconsistent TC API. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. So just to summarize the key takeaways. So yeah, uh, number one, uh, the key takeaways is that yeah, once um, again, uh, uh, the, to highlight the importance of API design. So once your API has been officially released and integrated with your first stakeholder, your API design is forever and yeah, getting it the right the first time is really important. So um, it also uh, ties to the cost to fix um, chart if you are familiar with it. So the cheapest um, the cheapest time you can make change is during design, and then the the expensive time you uh, want to change is during uh, product uh, is during production stage. So it's, uh, it will took like versioning and stuff. So it's better if you design it right at the first time. Yeah, the second of, uh, takeaway is that take design first approach. Um, yeah, as I mentioned before, uh, during design, it's very cheap to uh, change things uh, compared to uh, when uh, you want to change things in production. So yeah, use this time to ensure that you are solving the right problem, which is also very important. Yeah, uh, the third key takeaway is that uh, define standards. Uh, use uh, you can use uh, uh, OS, Open API specification, or any available tools. Um, yeah, actually, when we start uh, uh, with the standard, we actually only start with um, uh, a simple Google document. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, but as we are scaling, uh, we are trying to experiment with uh, OS as well, and it really helped us. Yeah. And then the standards will also have uh, product teams to be able to refer to the standards uh, whenever they need to design uh, the API for their for customers. Number four, people um, influence uh, design first mindset. And then uh, uh, don't forget to uh, train people. Uh, I found this uh, are the hardest, but not impossible. Uh, it, it just take time uh, and um, and consistency to be able to influence uh, mindset people mindset. Uh, to be able to adopt this first approach number five uh process um yeah we have uh, api design process and then some tips that i have um sh shared with you previously yeah which is like to identify decision makers uh, time box and then uh, managing stakeholders properly that's very important uh as well and then last but not least uh, uh i cannot uh, iterate enough uh to start small and iterate so yeah, just start small uh, and then um, get feedback and then iterate uh, on either on the technology people or process uh, side. So yeah, start small and iterate. 
so yeah, uh, I guess that's all uh, uh, for my sharing for today. Um, yeah, thanks uh, for your attention. Yeah. Thanks, Rumanto, for sharing uh, the insights from your journey. I'm sure many in the audience would have been able to relate to it, one or the other part of that journey. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully. Just, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, moving on to the Q&A. So there's a question. Uh, so do you have a direct access to the end users of your API? How do you link their success to your KPIs? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So. Um, uh, we we don't have uh, we don't have uh, access to our customers API, uh, but some of uh, like like Stripe they did uh, uh, they they went uh, went on went ahead and then uh, do pair programming with customers. That's something that we uh, wanted to do, but uh, didn't have the resources to do so yet. Uh, so we are taking feedback. Uh, uh, by uh, using uh, user interview and then uh, taking feedback from our DSD cats to be able to find the pain points that the customers uh, provided. Uh, for now, um, the success of uh, this initiative uh, is uh, uh, qualitative. Uh, it's being measured by qualitative uh, metrics. So uh, whether our um, whether our APIs are uh, easy for our customers to uh, to integrate, and then whether they find our APIs are delightful, and then uh, also uh, we also found, uh, track some quantitative metrics like CST cats at the moment. But yes, uh, those are some uh, measurement that we are taking at the moment. Yeah, so we uh, we kind of start small and then uh, iterate from there. So if we need more metrics, we can add easily from there. Yeah. Great question. Yeah, yeah. great. Uh, thanks, Lumento. Uh, thanks for sharing your journey with us. Yeah, thank you, Prasad. Yeah, see you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Last but not the least, uh, the last session in this Connecting the Stack track, we will be joined by Matt Shebel, Solutions Consultant at New Relic. Uh, he'll be talking to us about three reasons why APIs fail. Welcome, Matt. You're on mute. What a great start. What a rookie mistake to make. This is this is why video conferencing fails, because I start off on mute. <laughs> Hi, Prasant. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. Thank you. How are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm better now that everybody can hear me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, can you share? Yeah. Great. Excellent. Let me, let me jump right in. Um, all right, that is not moving forward. There we go. Hi, I'm Matt. Now, you might be able to see that I've got a ginger beard. I've got a bit of an accent. I wasn't born in Singapore. I've made this beautiful place my home. And I am, I'm so glad to be here, especially during these really you know, unexpected times. Um, I've been with New Relic um, a year now in Singapore, but I've also worked for New Relic in Dublin, Ireland, which is what might explain the accent a little bit. And in the meantime, I looked after, you know, OTT applications and helping traditional businesses move into the cloud space. So I've always been focused around the cloud, making sure that we take all technology and push it forward. And that's what I want to look at you I uh, would want to look at with you today as well. And so we're going to do three things today. The main thing is looking at why APIs fail and looking at three common reasons. And to do that, we'll first go, I guess, a step back to Elementor's talk. I really enjoyed that. I only watched the tail end of it, but it actually is is really interesting to see you know, the same topic from really different angles. So we'll start off with a really quick history of what is it that we speak of as APIs today? And why is it different today than it might have been five years or 10 years ago? Now, I like to call this the finger pointing portion, which is not, not business um, English I've learned. Um, it is called unproductive collaboration in, in, in professional terms. And we're going to look at what happens when your APIs fail. And then lastly, I'm open for questions. You will get my email address if we're running short on time, so don't worry about that. But I'm also keen to see if you have any questions that you want to share just as we're going through this panel today. So let's look at a quick 
recap of some of the early APIs that I think a lot of us will be able to relate to and just left a mark on us, right? And just over 21 years ago, Salesforce looked slightly differently and they started out with an XML API. I don't think they're too, too common other than in feeds these days, right? And Amazon did the same thing two years later just to make sure that people could publish you know, direct links to, to products on their websites and try to get that integration going. And so when we're looking at these, the idea of an API really is to connect two different services, to connect two parts of the internet that previously weren't working together. And the style of technology that's used for that, right, whether it's an XML feed or whether it's a REST API as, as Flickr then used in 2004, really depends on your use case. And this is where I get really excited and it gets really complicated and technical really quickly. So I'll try to keep it a bit high level today to just convey some of the concepts that we should be aware of to make sure that these APIs work smoothly. And then, of course, we can't forget Twitter. Um, and the use case, again, he was quite different to some of the other use cases that we've, we've seen. Twitter tried to make sure that people weren't scrapping the page, right? So again, they released an API to control access to data of a public website to a certain extent. And so as we've, we've kind of seen what companies have done and how companies have approached APIs and used them in different ways, technology has really changed as well. So in, in that previous slide, right, we kind of looked at, at that XML um, XML feed that, that was used by Salesforce and Amazon. And then we, we also heard REST being mentioned. And you know, there's this new terms that get thrown around every so often, and it really depends on the problem that you're trying to solve. Are you connecting to one external service that just pulls in data infrequently? Are you trying to make a thousand different calls to a service every second because every single request needs to be authenticated? Are you, you know, what kind of what kind of problem are you trying to solve? Is it an internal use case? Are you connecting to an external service? And so another thing that we should quickly look at before we just dive into reasons why APIs fail is the term microservice and API. Now, everybody's talking about microservices, I certainly am. And they're often linked with, with the term API because they need to be accessed in a way. And that's really, that's really what API describes as the way we access information that is in a, in a contained application. Right? It's really that connection in and a microservice or a monolith. Both can have APIs, but the more granular you go, or the more you break your application down into different microservices, the more API calls you will have to make, the more complex your environment will get. And you can appear it in my voice, the more excited I get, and the more I'm looking forward to having that conversation with you as well. And as we now go into the main portion of why we're here today, we're, we're kind of looking at why. APIs fail. And, and I guess looking at this a different way, the slightly more positive would be how can you take charge over the portions that you can control? Right? Because there are failures that you can control, and, and there's failures that are sort of out of your control. And so it's important to understand where you can put the right steps in motion to make sure you have knowledge of what is failing and also the tools in place to, to tackle that. Now, COVID has changed the world in so many ways we couldn't have expected. If somebody would have told you two years ago that you're going to be at home for a year, you're going to work from home for a year, not because you asked to, but because you're not allowed into the office and restaurants will be closed in most countries for the majority of the year. They might open for two weeks and then you're not allowed to go to them again, but you can still get takeaway through an app on your phone. I would have smiled with you with a faint smile and would have just walked away, probably. Um, and, and here we are, and that's exactly what is happening in so many countries where the way we access products that we've always used has changed drastically at a scale that nobody could anticipate. My grandma is ordering food on her phone. I was I thought the day where my grandma used, you know, the grandma emoji on WhatsApp was the highlight of my sort of adult life. But no, no, my grandma is now ordering food on her phone. She's not calling, she's ordering on an app. And and that was where I realized the world is changing in ways I could not have expected and I don't know how to cope with. But to make sure that your business does know how to cope with, you need to make sure you can meet the scale that happens when you 
can least expect it. Nobody has COVID scheduled into their calendars. Nobody has, you know, the next, the next, um, the next all-time high in in in, in crypto or, or market situation penciled into the calendar. So you can't you can't plan that. But yet you need to make sure you meet that demand. And as some of these some of these events happen, different parts of your application will be impacted really differently. Whether you know it's an all-time high where there's a specific trade component of your application that's really impacted, but let's look at Binance, for example, right? It's a it's a major exchange. They have so many products. And the reason they go down is often because that first valve is closed. People can't log in. Well, if people can't log in, then they can't do anything else on your page. And it might just take your entire page down, depending on how it's designed. So it's not just planning for the simple application that you have in mind that kind of fits onto a single screen, but it's actually planning for when that simple application gets more complex and you start getting, you know, red boxes on your on your monitoring dashboard, but you can't actually quite understand. You don't really know where it comes from and having the right having the right response to that. And so you can say, well if I've ticked the auto scaling box and and that's great. But that also comes at a cost. And it doesn't mean that the application will run smoothly because there's always that one component um, component that might just take down the application. One of the one of and there's many of these, but one of my favorite stories of how an entire online streaming platform went down is because well, it was 99.5% hosted in the cloud. There was one relatively unimportant um, application that was still on premise in a data center. That was next to a mall, and the mall had a fire, and that data center had to turn off electricity. And because that data center turned off electricity, suddenly the entire online streaming service went down for a couple of hours. It's knowing what to do, and it's knowing where to go when something happens. So to be able to scale for something you can't expect, you need to know when your apps are at capacity, when you're hitting those performance limits, and, and and have a healthy baseline of how your app is meant to work as well. Let's jump let's jump into 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 reason two. Actually, let's go back one step. Do apologize. So what happens when you don't scale, right? Going back to that Binance example and just touching onto onto that online online streaming service that went down is not only do you get negative backlash, you might get backlash on social media, you might not meet contractual obligations. If your service is providing a payment gateway for an online web shop that suddenly can't close any business, can't make any sales, there's going to be some liability there. And so it's always understanding what it is that you're actually trying to achieve. Are you in your head trying to achieve perfect uptime or are you preventing downtime? Right. What's the what's the cost of understanding how to make sure that your API is scale and you have full control over that? Is it the cost that you're paying for the infrastructure, the monitoring, and the alerting, or is it the cost that you don't have to pay by making sure they don't go down and you're not liable, you're not losing out on business? If you're if you're any food ordering app and you go down during during Harry Raya, but how's that going to impact your business? Right? It's, it's a busy time. A lot of people will order food and you go down, that's going to impact your bottom line. And that's what you're trying to get to. That's what you're trying to scale to. Now, like I said, we're kind of going from sort of a classic monolithic you know, environment to microservices. We're trying to make sure that our applications are lean, they're exciting, they're using fancy technology terms that have the people in the room understand the other half smiles along to politely. And that's really great. But what this does on the other side, apart from making you a really attractive employer, is it also means that your day-to-day -day job is getting incredibly hard because you need to make sure that you go from sort of the five boxes that you can point to easily and display on a single screen to the 20 boxes that suddenly go interconnected and you're trying to figure out how one service is used by five other services and is calling to the same database and how each of these is impacting each other. And if one of them goes red, do all of them go red? Or do you have failovers if you know one of them crashes? And what happens as you have different teams? And and the mentor was speaking to that, right? If you have different teams that have a different 
philosophy that have a different understanding of how to approach an API, how to build an API, you go too big too quickly, then it's really hard to understand how one problem might help you solve another problem because they're completely different. If every sort of microservice that you've built out in your own environment has a completely different DNA, then it's going to be really hard for you to make sure that if you find an issue, if you address an issue, to be able to copy that over to all the other services that you have. So it's a combination of planning ahead, having good guidelines, but then also as your complexity grows, making sure you don't start skipping steps because it happens really quickly. And it's great because it helps you be really fast in your development, but it also means you're falling a lot harder when it happens. So if you have a bottleneck, if you're going back to that OTT service, that video streaming service that went down, if you have a bottleneck that affects your entire infrastructure, if you have an Achilles heel that can take down your entire service because it was easier not to migrate that into the cloud and you know you would have had to put resources to it and it would have cost you a bit of money and so you avoid doing that. But at the end of the day, it also costs you you know, online revenue and, and, and reputation if you do go down. So it's always making sure that as your complexity grows, you're comfortable growing with that. Now, a third reason why APIs go down, and, and this is, again, very much related to, to the mental start. I feel like we should have connected beforehand and could have really done this intertwined, is making sure that your teams are actually accountable to the work they're doing. But on the flip side, you know which team is accountable for the work that has been done. So if you have a service that's responsible for a certain part, say you have an app and you log in, how do you know that the error that is causing every, every single you know, transaction to fail that's causing you to get flagged on social media is actually due to the login service and not to, due to another service? Let's use that Binance example. How do you know that if you just hear, oh, well, the entire exchange is down, it is due to the login team and that login component rather than another component. So as you go from sort of a very simple environment that we have in relative terms, very simple environment that we had in the previous screen, where what we're looking at here is probably, you know, an app and probably a, a normal amount of instances to something that suddenly looks a lot more colorful because more things, more things get added, you can start assigning responsibility to different services. So what you can't really see, because it might be slightly small on the, on the screen grab that I'm sharing, is that each of these services went from being just a white box, as I have it in the graph here, to having a face on them. Now, they're still called billing servers, or they're still called web portal, right? They still have the same names that they might have had in that and that map that we previously looked at displaying the architecture, but what has changed is we've assigned responsibility. So if the billing service is read, we know who to talk to. If the infra, infra component if an, or, or cluster has an issue, we know who to talk to because we've assigned a person to that. Now, this has two benefits. One of them clearly is you know who to talk to. The flip side of that is it improves the quality of your employees so much. Who gets the alert if something happens at 2 a.m. and if the entire app just crashes? Does everybody get an alert just in case to make sure you've got 17 sleepy people on a phone call to try to understand what might have happened and how to quickly solve it at 2 a.m.? Or can you actually set up your alerts in a way that the right team gets alerted on the right channel and knows where to look straight away, quickly resolves it and goes goes back to their life. And the same thing happens for people who are on call on weekend. Uh, shifts, whoever's been on call on weekend knows how stressful it can be, not just when something happens, but the weekends after something happened, because you always go into your weekend, you know you're on call, and you always go back with that thought in your head. But what if, what if something happens again? Can I actually go down to the pool, or will it take me too long to go back up? And so it's, it's, it's ensuring that your peace of mind and your employee's peace of mind is, is kept at a level that actually works for everybody. And there's a couple of ways to, to do that. 
right? And so a simple way is, is further abstracting, I guess, the way you look at your application and going from just looking at the app to actually looking at how the app or that particular API works together with the infrastructure and works together with other components that it's touching. So rather than looking at the entire, the entire application and seeing how the red sort of trickles down into all the components, just making sure you package it into smaller amounts. And then if there's an issue in one of these little packages, say in a, in a workload, as what we could call it, then that team that's been responsible for the login API and for the login infrastructure and for the login database, that team gets involved and that team looks at it because if the if the login doesn't go through, the login service is suddenly calling, causing an issue and and, and causing a, you know alerts to be to be triggered. Then that team can quickly dive in and see well is it on the app side? Is it the, the database that's too slow to respond? Is it the infrastructure? Are we getting too many requests that you know the server can't handle? It's easy. You have a part. You have the developer. You have the info um, chat right next to each other, and that DevOps approach really helps to quickly, quickly drill down into an issue. The other flip side with that is, once you have accountability, you're cutting down on alert noise. So not only are you making sure that the right person gets alerted, but you're also making sure that people only get alerted when there's actually an issue that they need to know about. And that, again, makes me want to, want to develop for you much more. Because I know that I can focus on my job, I can get my work done, and if there's an issue, issue, then I'll jump in and I'll try to try to resolve that. The way you look at that data, right? I'm kind of showing some screenshots just to give a bit of visual aid. Really depends on how you want to look at it as well. Whether you're kind of going for the traffic light system of well, green, orange. Up, there's an issue we're moving into red, or whether you want to focus on understanding baselines, irregularities, anomalies, and understanding how different parts, in this case, right, the app itself, you know, the infrastructure are connected. That depends on you. But the important bit is having as much information as you can in the same view. So what this screenshot is just highlighting with numbers here is if you're breaking your team down into groups, make sure that they can look at data that's relevant to you. To me, if I'm part of the login API team, I don't want to see data from the purchase checkout team. Right? I want to look at data that, that, that matters to me. And so if you have monitoring in place, it's really crucial to then focus in on these individual parts and just remove the noise. It's a bit like it's a bit like social media, right? Um, you can spend 15 minutes on social media and, and not learn a whole lot. Now, the reason this this comes into my head is because Duolingo, a language learning app, keeps telling me, well, this lesson's going to take 15 minutes. How much would you have learned on social media at the same time? And so you're kind of going, okay, I'm cutting out noise, I'm focusing on something that matters to me, learning the language. Now aligning this with with, with my core job, right? If I'm a developer. I want to focus on the data that matters to me, the performance that matters to me, seeing if my part of the application is hitting its limits or if it's doing all right. And if it's not doing all right, I want to get on to solving that very quickly. Now, that was sort of a high level view of what you can look at if, you, if you're starting out trying to understand how your APIs might function, where you might want to start and get sort of give you check marks in to ensure that they don't fail. If you want to dive into the nitty gritty and actually see how that could work in a real life example, join Jason tomorrow. He's got a bit more time than I do, so he's not quite as rushed in getting that information to you. And he loves a good question, so bring challenging questions and join him for an hour of fun of trying to understand how, when you're building your own API, you can make sure you get observability across that API. Um, kind of what I've hinted at today, but in with a bit of meat around it. So sign up for that session. I think it's around, I wanna say 11 a.m., 12 a.m., it's, it's around noon. Now, I did mention we're gonna have a bit of time for questions. I hope I didn't overrun. So, um, so I think this is where I was told I get 
me back on stage and you just embarrass me in front of everybody with questions I can't answer. <laughs> hey, Matt. Yeah. So, uh, one question. Um, so, uh, the earlier the question used to be when I want some service, when I want a system, do I build or a buy? Now we have moved on from that uh, quite a lot in many areas. And now it's more of uh, how fast can I go live, go start using that uh, system uh, sub sub when I subscribe or a buy, right? So how fast can I start seeing the result of using New Relic? How fast can I go live with, I mean, can I go pro into production there? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And uh, I um, so so New Relic, you can go live within within seconds, and that's the idea. Um, obviously, as a developer, you want to focus on on building the application. You don't want to focus on making sure you work around your monitoring solution. So you go live right. straight away. You deploy an agent in your life, um, and that's really the idea. So going back mm -hmm. to the mentor as well, um, if you start out. I would say start monitoring straight away because those early, those early baselines of how the API was, you know, performing in childhood days. I think that's a really good, really good learning curve on how you might want to perform as you scale towards towards being customer facing as well. Okay. Great. Just looking. Any further questions are there? Yes. If there's, uh, if there's no question, I will. Oh, see, I was going to sneakily sneak out of the. Okay, I'll, I'll pick that up. <laughs> <laughs> what API management component that you think really saves your team most of the time? What API management component? Yes. So, I, if I understand the question correctly, I would say understanding where in your infrastructure an issue happens, right? If you have microservices or even multiple external API calls, being able to pinpoint at the issue without searching, knowing just by looking at the first screen and saying, yep, that's where we need to go and uh, and have a look. I think that is, is crucial. So not spending time trying to figure out where it could have been, but just knowing, I think that's the important bit. Okay. Great. Uh, that's it, Matt. That's, that's awesome. Well, thanks for thanks for having me. Um, I did have my email address on the last slide. I think the slides were already taken off of the screen, but it's just mshavel at newrelic.com. So just m in my last name at newrelic.com. You're welcome to email me. You can just quickly scan that QR code and have my phone number as well and WhatsApp me. And I'm happy to have that conversation. I uh, thank you for, for having me today and have a lovely afternoon. Yeah, thank you. Be sure to stay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. That brings an end to the connecting the stack track in technical stage of API Day Singapore Live Day One. We'll have a 30 minutes break now. You can use this time to visit the booths of our sponsors. And there are some amazing goodies waiting for you, uh, waiting for the lucky ones at many of the stalls. Please do visit for the goodies to understand more about the products, to uh, understand how these products can help you uh, in your IT landscape and to perform and to provide services to your customers better. Uh, post the break, we will have sessions on sustainable technology as part of this technical stage. And on the industry stage, we will be having sessions on connecting industry. And there are some amazing workshops and roundtables also lined up on building event-driven APIs by Confluent and how, how App Mesh connects your microservices by Software AG. Thank you all for joining us uh, for these sessions at API Days Live Singapore. Thank you.